Speaks is one of the most remarkable works of channeled information in history. It is the product of a process that began when Jane Roberts received what she called her psychic initiation one evening in September 1963 as she sat writing poetry. As she explained it, quote, Suddenly my consciousness left my body and my mind was barraged by ideas that were astonishing and new to me at the time, unquote. Because of that experience, Miss Roberts and her husband, Robert Butts, started doing research into psychic activity and planning a book. In line with their research, they began experimenting with a Ouija board. After the first few sessions, the pointer spelled out messages that claimed to come from a personality calling himself Seth. As neither Miss Roberts or her husband had any psychic background, they initially presumed that the messages were coming from Miss Roberts' subconscious. However, she soon began to feel compelled to speak these messages aloud, and the Ouija board became redundant as, within a month, she was easily passing into trance and speaking for Seth while in the trance state. Seth communicated in twice-weekly sessions, in the process developing a continuing manuscript that would ultimately total over 6,000 typewritten pages. From those pages, Ms. Roberts first compiled a book titled The Seth Material. Then, on January 19, 1970, Seth announced that he would be dictating a book of his own. The dictation began two days later on January 21st and was concluded on August 11, 1971. An appendix was added over the following six weeks. The title that Seth gave to his book was Seth Speaks, The Eternal Validity of the Soul. In it, he discusses a vast range of subjects, in a text that is so voluminous, we cannot hope to reproduce it here in its entirety. Therefore, we have focused on some specific aspects and areas of various key issues. Among them, the identity and multidimensional aspect of the soul. Consciousness. Death and after-death experiences. Dreams. Reincarnation. Christ, his crucifixion, and the second coming the nature of God, and of good and evil, the rise and fall of civilizations that preceded Atlantis, and how a brotherhood of speakers has worked throughout history to preserve the essential knowledge of humankind. The information within this program is challenging, thought-provoking, sometimes controversial. We are sure you'll agree that it is also, in the truest sense of the word, remarkable. What you are about to hear are the words of Seth, as spoken by Jane Roberts and transcribed by her husband, Robert Butts, and narrated on this recording by Scott Turchin. As we begin, Seth speaks about himself, his environment, the nature of reality, and the nature of ourselves. You have heard of ghost hunters. I can quite literally be called a ghost writer, though I do not approve of the term ghost. It is true that I am usually not seen in physical terms. I do not like the word spirit, either. Yet, if your definition of that word implies the idea of a personality without a physical body, then I would have to agree that the description fits me. I address an unseen audience. However, I know that they exist, and therefore I shall ask each of them, now, to grant me the same privilege. I communicate with you through the auspices of a woman of whom I have become quite fond. To others, it seems strange that I address her as Rupert and him, but the fact is that I have known her in other times and places by other names. Names are not important, however. My name is Seth. Names are simply designations, symbols, and yet, since you must use them, I shall also. I write this with the cooperation of Rupert, who speaks the words for me. In this life, Rupert is called Jane, and her husband, Robert Butts, takes down the words that Jane speaks. I call him Joseph. You may suppose that you are physical creatures, bound within physical bodies, imprisoned within bone, flesh, and skin. If you believe that your existence is dependent upon this corporeal image, then you feel in danger of extinction. No physical form lasts, and no body, however beautiful in youth, retains the same vigor and enchantment in old age. If you identify with your own youth, or beauty, or intellect, or accomplishments, then there is the constant gnawing knowledge that these attributes can and will vanish. 
I am speaking to assure you that this is not the case. Basically, you are no more of a physical being than I am, and I have donned and discarded more bodies than I care to tell. I am quite independent of a physical image, and so are you. Consciousness creates form. It is not the other way around. All personalities are not physical. It is only because you are so busily concerned with daily matters that you do not realize that there is a portion of you who knows that its own powers are far superior to those shown by the ordinary self. You have each lived other existences, and that knowledge is within you, though you are not consciously aware of it. I hope that this will serve to release the deeply intuitive self within each of you, and to bring to the foreground of consciousness whatever particular insights will serve you most. I speak to those who believe in a God, and those who do not, to those who believe that science will find all answers as to the nature of reality, and to those who do not. I hope to give you clues that will enable you to study the nature of reality for yourself as you have never studied it before. There are several things that I shall ask you to understand. You are not stuck in time like a fly in a closed bottle whose wings are therefore useless. You cannot trust your physical senses to give you a true picture of reality. They are lovely liars with such a fantastic tale to tell that you believe it without question. You are sometimes wiser, more creative, and far more knowledgeable when you are dreaming than when you are awake. I am primarily a personality with a message. You create the world that you know. You have been given perhaps the most awesome gift of all, the ability to project your thought outward into physical form. The fact is that each of you creates your own physical reality, and en masse, you create both the glories and the terrors that exist within your earthly experience. Until you realize that you are the creators, you will refuse to accept this responsibility. Consciousness is a way of perceiving the various dimensions of reality. Consciousness as you know it is highly specialized. The physical senses allow you to perceive the three-dimensional world, and yet by their very nature they can inhibit the perception of other equally valid dimensions. Most of you identify with your daily physically oriented self. You do not identify with the inner portion of yourselves. You prefer to identify with the part of you who watches television or cooks or works, the part you think knows what it is doing. But the seemingly unconscious portion of yourself is far more knowledgeable, and upon its smooth functioning your entire physical existence depends. This portion is conscious, aware, alert. I call it the inner ego for it directs inner activities. It correlates information that is perceived not through the physical senses, but through other inner channels. It is the inner perceiver of reality that exists beyond the three-dimensional. It carries within it the memory of each of your past existences. The outer ego and the inner ego operate together, the one to enable you to manipulate in the world that you know, the other to bring you those delicate inner perceptions without which physical existence could not be maintained. There is, however, a portion of you, the deeper identity, who forms both the inner ego and the outer ego, who decided that you would be a physical being in this place and in this time. This is the core of your identity, the psychic seed from which you sprang, the multidimensional personality of which you are part. You cannot understand yourselves, and you cannot accept my independent existence until you rid yourself of the notion that personality is a here-and-now attribute of consciousness. The self that you know is but one fragment of your entire identity. These fragment selves are not strung together, however, like beads on a string. They are more like the various skins of an onion or segments of an orange, all connected through the one vitality and growing out into various realities while springing from the same source. Nothing exists, neither rock, mineral, plant, animal, or air that is not filled with consciousness of its own kind. So you stand amid a constant vital commotion, a gestalt of aware energy, and you are yourselves physically composed of conscious cells that carry within themselves the realization of their own identity, that cooperate willingly to form the corporeal structure that is your physical body. I am saying, of course, that there is no such thing as dead matter. There is no object that was not formed by consciousness, and each consciousness, regardless of its degree, rejoices in sensation and creativity. 
You cannot understand what you are unless you understand such matters. The ego is a jealous god, and it wants its interests served. It does not want to admit the reality of any dimensions except those within which it feels comfortable and can understand. If you have a limited conception of the nature of reality, then your ego will do its best to keep you in the small and closed area of your accepted reality. If, on the other hand, your intuitions and creative instincts are allowed freedom, then they communicate some knowledge of greater dimensions to this most physically oriented portion of your personality. Personality is a gestalt of ever-changing perception. It is the part of the identity which perceives. I do not force my perceptions upon the woman through whom I speak, nor is her consciousness blotted out during our communications. Instead, there is an expansion of her consciousness and a projection of energy that is directed away from three-dimensional reality. This concentration away from the physical system may make it appear as if her consciousness is blotted out. Instead, more is added to it. There is within Rupert's personality a rather unique facility that makes our communications possible. I will try to put this as simply as possible. There is within his psyche what amounts to a transparent dimensional warp that serves almost like an open window through which other realities can be perceived. A multi-dimensional opening that has to some extent escaped being clouded over by the shade of physical focus. The physical senses usually blind you to these open channels, for they perceive reality only in their own image. To some extent, then, I enter your reality through a psychological warp in your space and time. In a manner of speaking, such an open channel serves much as a pathway between Rubert's personality and my own, so that communication is possible between. My environment now is not the one in which you will find yourself immediately after death. You must die many times before you enter this particular plane of existence. Birth is much more of a shock than death. Sometimes when you die you do not realize it, but birth almost always implies a sharp and sudden recognition. So there is no need to fear death. And I, who have died more times than I care to tell, speak these words to tell you so. In my home environment, I assume whatever shape I please, and it may vary, and does, with the nature of my thoughts. This ability to change form is an inherent characteristic of any consciousness. Only the degree of proficiency and actualization varies. You can see this in your own system, in a slowed-down version, when you observe the changing forms taken by living matter through its evolutionary history. My environment changes constantly, and therefore is composed of exquisite imbalances where change is allowed full play. Your own time structure misleads you into your ideas of the relative permanency of physical matter, and you close your eyes to the constant alterations within it. Your physical senses confine you, as best they can, to the perception of a highly formalized reality. Only through the use of the intuitions, and in sleep and dream states, as a rule, can you perceive the joyfully changing nature of your own and any consciousness. Now, many of these freedoms are quite natural to you in the dream state, and you form dream environments often to exercise such potentials. You can learn to change your physical environment by learning to change and manipulate your dream environment. You can also suggest specific dreams in which a desired change is seen, and under certain conditions, these will then appear in your physical reality. Often you do this without realizing it. The senses that you use, in a very real manner, create the environment that you perceive. Your physical senses necessitate the perception of a three-dimensional reality. Consciousness is equipped with inner perceptors, however. These are inherent within all consciousness, regardless of its development. Using the inner senses, we become conscious creators, co-creators. But you are unconscious co-creators, whether you know it or not. If our environment seems unstructured to you, it is only because you do not understand the true nature of order, which has nothing to do with permanent form, but only appears to have from your perspective. It is quite true that your physical senses create the reality that they perceive. A tree is something far different to a microbe, a bird, an insect, and a man who stands beneath it. I am not saying that the tree only appears to be different. It is different. You perceive its reality through one set of highly specialized senses, this does not mean that its reality exists in that form in any more basic way than it exists in the form perceived by the microbe, insect, or bird. 
you cannot perceive the quite valid reality of that tree in any context but your own. This applies to anything within the physical system that you know. It is not that physical reality is false. It is that the physical picture is simply one of an infinite number of ways of perceiving the various guises through which consciousness expresses itself. The physical senses force you to translate experience into physical perceptions. The inner senses open your range of perception, allow you to interpret experience in a far freer manner, and to create new forms and new channels through which you, or any consciousness, can know itself. You look out into the physical universe and interpret reality according to the information received from your outer senses. You are fascinated with physical reality, and you are in as deep a trance now as the woman is through whom I write this book. All of your attention is focused in a highly specialized way upon one shining bright point that you call reality. There are other realities all about you, but you ignore their existence, and you blot out all stimuli that come from them. There is a reason for such a trance, as you will discover, but little by little you must wake up. My purpose is to open your inner eyes. Your ideas of space are highly erroneous. In a very real manner, space as you perceive it simply does not exist. Not only is the illusion of space caused by your own physical perceptive mechanisms, but is also caused by mental patterns that you have accepted. Patterns that are adopted by consciousness when it reaches a certain stage of evolution within your system. When you arrive or emerge into physical life, not only is your mind not a blank slate, waiting for the scrolls that experience will write upon it, but you are already equipped with a memory bank far surpassing that of any computer. You face your first day upon the planet with skills and abilities already built in, though they may or may not be used, and they are not merely the result of heredity as you think of it. You may think of your soul or entity, though only briefly and for the sake of this analogy, as some conscious and living, divinely inspired computer who programs its own existences and lifetimes. Your planetary systems exist at once, simultaneously, both in time and in space. The universe that you seem to perceive, either visually or through instruments, appears to be composed of galaxies, stars, and planets at various distances from you. Basically, however, this is an illusion. Your senses and your very existence as physical creatures program you to perceive the universe in such a way. The universe, as you know it, is your interpretation of events as they intrude upon your three-dimensional reality. The events are mental. When I enter your system, I move through a series of mental and psychic events. You would interpret these events as space and time, and so, often, I must use these terms, for I must use your language rather than my own. When I enter your environment, I turn my consciousness in your direction. In one way, I translate what I am into an event that you can understand to some extent. In a much more limited manner, any artist does the same thing when he translates what he is, or a portion of it, into a painting. When I enter your system, I intrude into three-dimensional reality. Whether or not you realize it, each of you intrudes into other systems of reality in your dream states without the full participation of your normally conscious self. In subjective experience, you leave behind physical existence and act, at times, with strong purpose and creative validity within dreams that you forget the instant you awaken. When I contact your reality, therefore, it is as if I were entering one of your dreams. I can be aware of myself as I dictate this book through Jane Roberts, and yet also be aware of myself in my own environment. I send only a portion of myself here, as you perhaps send out a portion of your consciousness as you write a letter to a friend, and yet are aware of the room in which you sit. I send out much more than you do in a letter, for a portion of my consciousness is now within the entranced woman as I dictate, but the analogy is close enough. <laughs> And now Seth speaks of the soul and the nature of perception. With a little background given so far, we can begin to discuss the subject of this program, the eternal validity of the soul. Even when we are exploring other issues, we will be trying to illustrate the multidimensional aspect of this inner self. There are many misconceptions connected with it, and first of all, we shall try to dismiss these. 
First of all, a soul is not something that you have. It is what you are. I usually use the term entity in preference to the term soul, simply because its connotations are less religious in an organizational sense. The trouble is that you frequently consider the soul, or entity, as a finished, static thing that belongs to you but is not you. The soul, or entity, in other words, your most intimate, powerful inner identity, is and must be forever changing. It is not, therefore, something like a cherished heirloom. It is alive, responsive, curious. It forms the flesh and the world that you know, and it is in a state of becoming. Often it seems that the soul is thought of as a precious stone, to be finally presented as a gift to God, or considered as some women used to consider their virginity, something highly prized that must be lost, the losing of it being signified as a fine gift to the receiver. In many philosophies, this sort of idea is retained, the soul being returned to a primal giver, or being dissolved in a nebulous state somewhere between being and non-being. The soul is, however, first of all, creative. The soul, or entity, is itself the most highly motivated, most highly energized, and most potent consciousness unit known in any universe. It is energy concentrated to a degree quite unbelievable to you. It contains unlimited potentials, but it must work out its own identity and form its own worlds. It carries within it the burden of all being. Within it are personality potentials beyond your comprehension. Remember, this is your own soul or entity I am speaking of, as well as soul or entity in general. You are one manifestation of your own soul. How many of you would want to limit your reality, your entire reality, to the experience you now know? You do this when you imagine that your present self is your entire personality, or insist that your identity be maintained unchanged through an endless eternity. The soul, above all, perceives and creates. Remember again that you are a soul now. The soul within you, therefore, is now perceiving. Its methods of perception are the same now as they were before your physical birth and as they will be after your physical death. So basically, the inner portion of you, the soul stuff, will not suddenly change its methods of perception nor its characteristics after physical death. You can find out what the soul is now, therefore, it is not something waiting for you at your death, nor is it something you must save or redeem, and it is also something that you cannot lose. The term, to lose or save your soul, has been grossly misinterpreted and distorted, for it is the part of you that is indeed indestructible. Your own personality as you know it, that portion of you that you consider most precious, most uniquely you, will also never be destroyed or lost. It is a portion of the soul. The soul perceives all experience directly. Most experiences of which you are aware come packaged in physical wrapping, and you take the wrapping for the experience itself and do not think of looking inside. The soul, however, does not need to follow the laws and principles that are a part of the physical reality, and it does not depend upon physical perception. The soul's perceptions are of acts and events that are mental, that lie, so to speak, beneath physical events as you know them. The soul's perceptions are not dependent upon time, because time is a physical camouflage and does not apply to non-physical reality. It then follows that some hints of the soul's direct experience can be gained by momentarily switching the physical senses off, by refusing to use them as perceptors, and falling back upon other methods. Now you do this to some extent in the dream state, but even then, in many dreams, you still tend to translate experience into hallucinatory physical terms. Most of the dreams that you recall are of this nature. At certain depths of sleep, however, the soul's perception operates relatively unhampered. You drink, so to speak, from the pure well of perception. You communicate with the depths of your own being and the source of your creativity. These experiences, not being translated physically, do not remain in the morning. You do not remember them as dreams. The soul can be considered as an electromagnetic energy field of which you are part. It is a field of concentrated action when you consider it in this light, a powerhouse of probabilities or probable actions seeking to be expressed. It is a grouping of non-physical consciousness that nevertheless knows itself as an identity. Look at it this way. The young woman through whom I speak, once stated in a poem, 
and I quote, These atoms speak and call themselves my name, unquote. Your physical body is a field of energy with a certain form, however, and when someone asks you your name, your lips speak it. And yet, the name does not belong to the atoms and molecules in the lips that utter the syllables. The name has meaning only to you. Within your body, you cannot put your finger upon your own identity. If you could travel within your body, you could not find where your identity resides. Yet you say, this is my body, and this is my name. The soul is not frightened for its identity. It is sure of itself. It ever seeks. It is not afraid of being overwhelmed by experience or perception. If you had a more thorough understanding of the nature of identity, you would not, for example, fear telepathy. For behind this concern is the worry that your identity will be swept away by the suggestions or thoughts of others. It seems to you that you have only one form, the physical one that you perceive, and no other. It also seems that your form can only be in one place at one time. You have indeed other forms that you do not perceive, and you also create various kinds of forms for various purposes, although you do not perceive these physically either. You are presently focused not only in your physical body, but within a particular frequency of events that you interpret as time. Other historical periods exist simultaneously in forms quite as valid, and other reincarnational selves. Again, you simply are not tuned to those frequencies. You can know what happened in the past and have histories because according to the rules of the game that you accepted, you believe that the past, but not the future, can be perceived. You could have histories of the future in the present if the rules of the game were different. In other levels of reality, the rules of the game change. After death, in your terms, you are quite free perceptively. The future appears as clearly as the past. The so-called stream of consciousness is simply that, one small stream of thoughts, images, and impressions, part of a much deeper river of consciousness that represents our own far greater existence and experience. You spend all your time examining this one small stream so that you become hypnotized by its flow and entranced by its motion. Simultaneously, these other streams of perception and consciousness go by without your notice yet they are very much a part of you. They represent quite valid aspects, events, actions, and emotions with which you are also involved in other layers of reality. You are as actively and vividly concerned in these realities as you are in the one in which your main attention is now focused. Often you tune into these other streams of consciousness without realizing you have done so. For again, they are a part of the same river of your identity. All are therefore connected. Any creative work involves you in a cooperative process in which you learn to dip into these other streams of consciousness. You come up with a perception that has far more dimensions than one arising from the one narrow, usual stream of consciousness that you know. Great creativity is then multidimensional for this reason. Its origin is not from one reality, but from many, and it is tinged with the multiplicity of that origin. Great creativity always seems greater than its pure physical dimension and reality. By contrast with the so-called usual, it appears almost as an intrusion. It takes the breath away. Such creativity automatically reminds each man of his own multidimensional reality. The words, know thyself, therefore, mean far more than most people ever suppose. In moments of solitude, you may become aware of some of these other streams of consciousness, these other existences of yours go on quite merrily, whether you are waking or sleeping, but while you are awake, ordinarily you block them out. In the dream state, you are much more aware of them, although there is a final process of dreaming that often masks intense psychological and psychic experience. Unfortunately, what you usually recall is this final dream version. Some dreams themselves do take place in psychic or mental areas connected with your daily activities but in the very deep reaches of sleep experience, those, incidentally, not yet touched upon by scientists in so-called dream laboratories, you are in communication with other portions of your own identity and with the other realities in which they exist.
Some waking states, of course, come very close to sleep states. These blend one into the other so that the rhythm often goes unnoticed. These gradations of consciousness are accompanied by changes in the physical organism. In the more sluggish periods of waking consciousness, there is a lack of concentration, a cutting off of stimuli to varying degrees, an increase in accidents, and generally a lower body tone. Because of your habits of an extended sleep period, followed by an extended waking period, you do not take advantage of these rhythms of consciousness. The high peaks are to some extent smothered, or even go unnoticed. The sharp contrast and the high efficiency of the natural waking consciousness is barely utilized. Two sleep periods of three hours apiece would be quite sufficient for most people if the proper suggestions were given before sleep, suggestions that would ensure the body's complete recuperation. There are many variations, in fact, that would be better than your present system. Ideally, sleeping five hours at a time, you gain the maximum benefit, and anything else over this time is not nearly as helpful. Those who require more sleep would then take, say, a two-hour nap. For others, a four-hour sleep session and two naps would be highly beneficial. I am giving you all of this material here because it will help you understand and use your present abilities. You are asking too much of normal waking consciousness, smoothing out the valleys and peaks of its activity, demanding in some cases that it go full blast ahead when it is actually at a minimal period, denying yourself the great mobility of consciousness that is possible. In some cases, you literally force yourself to sleep when your consciousness could be at one of its maximum points. This is, incidentally, in the pre-dawn period. In certain afternoon hours, consciousness is lowered and needs refreshment that is instead denied to it. If the stages of waking consciousness were examined as sleep stages are presently being examined, for example, you would find a much greater range of activity than is suspected. Certain transition stages are completely ignored. In many ways it can be said that consciousness does indeed flicker and varies in intensities. It is not like a steady beam of light. A clear, uncluttered, bright, and powerful consciousness needs frequent rest periods if its efficiency is to be maintained and if it is to correctly interpret reality. Otherwise, it distorts what is perceived. <laughs> Now, Seth speaks of death and after-death experiences. What happens at the point of death? The question is much more easily asked than answered. Basically, there is not any particular point of death in those terms, even in the case of a sudden accident. I will attempt to give you a practical answer to what you think of as this practical question, however. What the question really means to most people is this. What will happen when I am not alive in physical terms any longer? What will I feel? Will I still be myself? Will the emotions that propelled me in life continue to do so? Is there a heaven or a hell? Will I be greeted by gods or demons, enemies or beloved ones? Most of all, the question means, when I am dead, will I still be who I am now, and will I remember those who are dear to me now? First of all, let us consider the fact just mentioned. There is no separate, indivisible, specific point of death. Life is a state of becoming, and death is a part of this process of becoming. You are alive now, a consciousness knowing itself, sparkling with cognition amid a debris of dead and dying cells, alive while the atoms and molecules of your body die and are reborn. You are alive, therefore, in the midst of small deaths. Portions of your own image crumble away moment by moment, and are replaced, and you scarcely give the matter a thought. So you are to some extent alive now in the midst of the death of yourself, alive despite and yet because of the multitudinous deaths and rebirths that occur within your body in physical terms. If the cells did not die and were not replenished, the physical image would not continue to exist. So now in the present, as you know it, your consciousness flickers about your ever-changing corporeal image. In many ways, you can compare your consciousness as you know it now to a firefly, for while it seems to you that your consciousness is continuous, this is not so. It also flickers off and on, though it is never completely extinguished. Its focus is not nearly as constant as you suppose, however. 
So as you are alive in the midst of your own multitudinous small deaths, so though you do not realize it, you are often dead, even amid the sparkling life of your own consciousness. There are overall rhythms, and within them an infinity of individual variations, almost like cosmic metabolism. In these terms, what you call death is simply the insertion of a longer duration of that pulsation of which you are not aware, a long pause in that other dimension, so to speak. The death, say, of physical tissue is merely a part of the process of life as you know it in your system, a part of the process of becoming. And from those tissues, as you know, new life will spring. All through your lifetime, portions of your body die, and the body that you have now does not contain one particle of physical matter that it had, say, ten years ago. This process, you see, continues so smoothly that you are not aware of it. The pulses mentioned earlier are so short in duration that your consciousness skips over them merrily, yet your physical perception cannot seem to bridge the gap when the longer rhythm of pulsation occurs. And so, this is the time that you perceive as death. What you want to know, therefore, is what happens when your consciousness is directed away from physical reality, and when momentarily it seems to have no image to wear. You will find yourself in another form, an image that will appear physical to you to a large degree, as long as you do not try to manipulate within the physical system with it. Then the differences between it and the physical body will become obvious. You will simply be learning to operate in a new environment in which different laws apply, and the laws are far less limiting than the physical ones with which you now operate. In other words, you must learn to understand and use new freedoms. Even these experiences will vary, however, and even this state is a state of becoming, for many will continue into other physical lives. Some will exist and develop their abilities in different systems of reality altogether, and so for a time will remain in this intermediary state. For those of you who are lazy, I can offer no hope. Death will not bring you an eternal resting place. You may rest, if this is your wish, for a while. Not only must you use your abilities after death, however, but you must face up to yourself for those that you did not use during your previous existence. Now when I speak to you, I very seldom use such words as love. I do not tell you that a god is waiting for you on the other side of a golden door. I do not reassure you by telling you that when you are dead, God will be waiting for you in all his majestic mercy, and that that will be the end of your responsibility. However, through traveling within yourselves, you will discover the unity of your consciousness with other consciousnesses. You will discover the multidimensional love and energy that gives consciousness to all things. This will not lead you to want to rest upon the proverbial blessed bosom. It will instead inspire you to take a better hand in the job of creation. That feeling of divine presence you will find indeed and feel indeed, for you will sense it behind the dance of the molecules and in yourselves and in your neighbors. You may or may not be greeted by friends or relatives immediately following death. This is a personal matter, as always. Overall, you may be far more interested in people that you have known in past lives than those close to you in the present one, for example. Your true feeling toward relatives who are also dead will be known to you and to them. There is no hypocrisy. You do not pretend to love a parent who did little to earn your respect or love. Telepathy operates without distortion in this after-death period, so you must deal with the true relationships that exist between yourself and all relatives and friends who await you. You may find that someone you considered merely an enemy actually deserve your love and respect, for example, and you will then treat him accordingly. You examine the fabric of the existence you have left, and you learn to understand how your experiences were the result of your own thoughts and emotions and how these affected others. Until this examination is through, you are not yet aware of the larger portions of your own identity. When you realize the significance and meaning of the life you have just left, then you are ready for conscious knowledge of your other existences. You become aware, then, of an expanded awareness. What you are begins to include what you have been in other lives, and you begin to make plans for your next physical existence, if you decide upon one. You can instead enter another level of reality, and then return to a physical existence if you choose. An individual can be so certain that death is the end of all 
that oblivion, though temporary, results. In many cases, immediately on leaving the body, there is, of course, amazement and a recognition of the situation. The body itself may be viewed, for example, and many funerals have a guest of honor amidst the company, and no one gazes into the face of the corpse with as much curiosity and wonder. After leaving the physical body, you will immediately find yourself in another. This is the same kind of form in which you travel in out-of-body projections, and again, let me remind you that each of you leaves your body for some time each night during sleep. This form will seem physical. It will not be seen by those still in the physical body, however, generally speaking. It can do anything that you do now in your dreams. Therefore, it flies, goes through solid objects, and is moved directly by your will, taking you, say, from one location to another. You cannot, as a rule, manipulate physical objects. This body is yours instantly, but it is not the only form that you will have. For that matter, this image is not a new one. It is interwound with your physical body now, but you do not perceive it. Following death, it will be the only body you are aware of for some time. After-death experiences will not seem so alien or incomprehensible if you realize that you encounter similar situations as a normal part of your present existence. In sleep and dream states, you are involved in the same dimension of existence in which you will have your after-death experiences. You do not remember the most important part of these nightly adventures, and so those you do recall seem bizarre or chaotic as a rule. The simple fact is that when you dream you are flying, you often are. In the dream state, you operate under the same conditions, more or less, that are native to a consciousness not focused in physical reality. Many of your experiences, therefore, are precisely those you may meet after death. You may speak with dead friends or relatives, revisit the past, greet old classmates, walk down the streets that existed 50 years earlier in physical time, travel through space without taking any physical time to do so, be met by guides, be instructed, teach others, perform meaningful work, solve problems, hallucinate. As your daily endeavors have meaning and purpose, so do your dream adventures, and in these also you attain various goals of your own. In the dream state you learn, among other things, how to construct your own physical reality day by day, just as after death you learn how to construct your next physical lifetime. After death environments exist all about you now, period. It is as if your present situation and all its physical phenomena were projected from within yourself outward, giving you a continuous running motion picture, forcing you to perceive only those images that were being transposed. These seem so real that you find yourself in a position of reacting to them constantly. They serve to mask other quite valid realities that exist at the same time, however. It is actually from these other realities that you gain the power and the knowledge to operate the material projections. You can set the machine on idle, so to speak, stop the apparent motion, and turn your attention to these realities. In many ways, then, you are dead now and as dead as you will ever be. While you go about your daily chores and endeavors, beneath normal waking consciousness, you are constantly focused in other realities also, reacting to stimuli of which your physical conscious self is not aware, perceiving conditions through the inner senses, and experiencing events that are not even registered within the physical brain. After death, you are simply aware of these dimensions of activity that you now ignore, now, physical existence predominates. Then, it will not. Nor, however, will it be lost to you. Your memories, for example, will be retained. You will simply step out of a particular framework of reference. If you want to know what death is like, then become aware of your own consciousness as it is divorced from physical activities. You will find that it is highly active. With practice, you will discover that your normal waking consciousness is highly limited and that what you thought of once as death conditions seem much more like life conditions. In the same way, in the midst of life, you dwell with so-called ghosts and apparitions, and for that matter, you yourselves appear as apparitions to others. There are obviously as many kinds of ghosts and apparitions as there are people. They are as alert or as unalert to their situation as you are to your own. They are not fully focused in physical reality, however, either in personality or in form, 
and this is their main distinction. If a ghost wants to contact you, he can do so through telepathy. Or the individual might send you a thought form at the same time that he telepathically communicates with you. Your rooms are full now of thought forms that you do not perceive. And again, you are as much a ghostly phenomenon now as you will be after death. You are simply not aware of the fact. You ignore certain temperature variations and stirring of air as imagination that are instead indicative of such thought forms. You thrust into the background telepathic communications that often accompany such forms. You turn aside from all clues that other realities exist quite validly with your own and that in the midst of one existence you are surrounded by intangible but valid evidence. The very words life and death serve to limit your understanding, to set up barriers where none intrinsically exist. Some dead friends and relatives do visit you, projecting from their own level of reality into yours, but you cannot as a rule perceive their forms. They are not more ghostly or dead, however, than you are when you project into their reality, as you do from the sleep state. As a rule, however, they can perceive you on those occasions. What you often forget is that such individuals are in various stages of development. Some have stronger connections to the physical system than others. The length of time an individual has been dead, in your terms, has little to do with whether or not you will be so visited, but rather the intensity of the relationship. In the sleep state, you may help recently dead persons, complete strangers, to acclimate to after-death conditions, even though this knowledge is not available to you in the morning. So others, strangers, may communicate with you when you are sleeping and even guide you through various periods of your life. Continuing the subject of life after death, Seth now speaks of reincarnation. There are unlimited varieties of experience open to you after death, all possible, but some less probable than others according to your development. You may decide upon another reincarnation. You may decide to focus instead on your past life, using it as the stuff of new experience, creating variations of events as you have known them, making corrections as you choose. Now some individuals, some personalities, prefer a life organization bound about past, present, and future in a seemingly logical structure, and these persons usually choose reincarnation. Others prefer to experience events in an extraordinarily intuitive manner, with the organization being provided by the associative processes. Some simply find the physical system not to their liking, and in such a way take leave of it. This cannot be done, however, until the reincarnational cycle, once chosen, is completed. The last choice exists for those who have developed their abilities through reincarnation as far as possible within that system. If you hate another person, that hate may bind you to him through as many lives as you allow the hate to consume you. You draw to yourself in this existence and in all others those qualities upon which you concentrate your attention. If you vividly concern yourself with the injustices you feel have been done you, then you attract more such experience. And if this goes on, then it will be mirrored in your next existence. It is true that in between lives there is time for understanding and contemplation. Those who do not take advantage of such opportunities in this life often do not do so when it is over. Consciousness will expand. It will create. It will turn itself inside out to do so. There is nothing outside of yourself that will force you to understand these issues or face them. It is useless then to say, when this life is over I will look back upon my experience and then my ways. This is like a young man saying, when I grow old and retire, I will use all those abilities that I am not now developing. You are setting the stage for your next life now. The thought you think today will in one way or another become the fabric of your next existence. There are no magic words that will make you wise, that will fill you with understanding and compassion, that will expand your consciousness. Your thoughts and everyday experience contain the answers. Any successes in this life, any abilities, have been worked out through past experience, 
They are yours by right. You worked to develop them. If you look about you at your relatives, friends, acquaintances, and business associates, you will also see what kind of a person you are, for you are drawn to them as they are drawn to you through very basic inner similarities. Let me try to throw some light upon what I am trying to tell you. First of all, love always involves freedom. If a man says he loves you and yet denies you your freedom, then you often hate him. Yet because of his words, you do not feel justified in the emotion. This sort of emotional tangle itself can lead to continued entanglements through various lives. If you hate evil, then beware of your conception of the word. Hate is restrictive. It narrows down your perception. It is indeed a dark glass that shadows all of your experience. You will find more and more to hate and bring the hated elements into your own experience. If you expand your sense of love, of health and existence, then you are drawn in this life and in others toward those qualities, again, because they are those upon which you concentrate. In the next life, you will be working with those attitudes that are now yours. If you insist upon harboring hatreds within you now, you are very likely to continue doing so. On the other hand, those sparks of truth, intuition, love, joy, creativity, and accomplishment gained now will work for you then as they do now. They are, you see, the only true realities. They are the only real foundations of existence. It is foolish, as Rupert once said, to hate a storm or shake your fists at it and call it names. You may laugh if you think of children in such activities. It is useless to personify a storm and treat it as a demon, focusing upon its destructive elements or those elements that to you appear destructive. Change of form is not destructive. The explosive energy of a storm is highly creative. Consciousness is not annihilated. A storm is part of creativity. You view it from your own perspective. And yet, one individual will feel within the storm the unending cycle of creativity, and another will personify it as the work of the devil. Through all your lives, you will interpret the reality that you see in your own way, and that way will have its effect upon you, and in turn upon others. The man who literally hates immediately sets himself up in this fashion, he prejudges the nature of reality according to his own limited understanding. Now, I am emphasizing the issue of hate as I discuss reincarnation because its results can be so disastrous. A man who hates always believes himself justified. He never hates anything that he believes to be good. He thinks he is being just, therefore, in his hatred. But the hatred itself forms a very strong claim that will follow him throughout his lives until he learns that only the hatred itself is the destroyer. Now, Seth speaks of the dimensions of God and of the crucifixion of Christ. As the present life of any individual rises from hidden dimensions beyond those easily accessible in physical terms, and as it draws its energy and power to act from unconscious sources, so does the present physical universe, as you know it, rise from other dimensions. So does it have its source and derive its energy from deeper realities. History, as you know it, represents but one single light upon which you focus. You interpret the events that you see therein, and you project upon its glimmer your interpretation of events that may occur. So entranced is your concentration that when you wonder about the nature of reality, you automatically confine your question to this one small flickering moment that you call physical reality. When you ponder upon the aspects of God, you unthinkingly speak of the creator of that one light. That light is unique, and if you truly understood what it was, you would indeed understand the nature of true reality. Only a portion of your entire identity is presently familiar to you, as you know. Therefore, when you consider the question of a supreme being, you imagine a male personality with those abilities that you yourselves possess, with great emphasis upon qualities you admire. This imagined God has therefore changed throughout your centuries, mirroring man's shifting ideas of himself. God was seen as cruel and powerful when man believed that these were desirable characteristics, needed particularly in his battle for physical survival. He projected these upon his idea of a God because he envied them and feared them. You have cast your idea of God, therefore, in your own image, 
In a reality that is inconceivably multidimensional, the old concepts of God are relatively meaningless. Even the term, a supreme being, is in itself distortive, for you naturally project the qualities of human nature upon it. If you will try to accept the idea that your own existence is multidimensional, that you dwell within the medium of infinite probabilities, then you may catch a slight glimpse of the reality that is behind the word God and you may understand why it is almost impossible to capture a true understanding of that concept in words. God, therefore, is first of all a creator, not of one physical universe, but of an infinite variety of probable existences, far more vast than those aspects of the physical universe with which your scientists are familiar. He did not simply send a son to live and die on one small planet. He is a part of all probabilities. There have been parables told and stories of beginnings. All of these have been attempts to transmit knowledge in as simple terms as possible. Often, answers were given to questions that literally have no meaning outside of your own system of reality. For example, there was no beginning and there will be no end. Yet, parables have been given telling you of beginnings and endings simply because with your distorted ideas of time, beginnings and endings seem to be inseparable, valid events. Your Christ figure represents, symbolically, your idea of God and his relationships. There were three separate individuals whose history blended, and they became known collectively as Christ. Hence, many discrepancies in your records. These were all males, because at that time of your development, you would not have accepted a female counterpart. These individuals were a part of one entity. You could not but imagine God as a father. It would never have occurred to you to imagine a god in any other than human terms, earth components. The events of the crucifixion of Christ, as they are recorded, did not occur in history. It was a psychic, but not a physical event. Ideas of almost unimaginable magnitude were played out. Judas, for example, was not a man in your terms. He was, like all the other disciples, a blessed, created, fragment personality formed by the Christ personality. He represented the self-betrayer. He dramatized a portion of each individual's personality that focuses upon physical reality in a grasping manner and denies the inner self out of greed. Each of the twelve represented qualities of personality that belong to one individual, and Christ as you know him represented the inner self. The twelve, therefore, plus Christ as you know him, the one figure composed of the three, represented an individual earthly personality, that is, the inner self and twelve main characteristics connected with the egotistical self. As Christ was surrounded by the disciples, so the inner self is surrounded by these physically oriented characteristics, each drawn outward toward daily reality on the one hand, and yet orbiting the inner self. The disciples, therefore, were given physical reality by the inner self, as all of your earthly characteristics come out of your inner nature. This was a living parable, made flesh among you, a cosmic play worked out for your behalf, couched in terms that you could understand. The lessons were made plain, as all the ideas behind them were personified. If you will forgive the term, this was like a local morality play, put on in your corner of the universe. This does not mean it was less real than you previously supposed. In fact, the implications of what is said here should clearly hint at the more powerful aspects of godhood. The same kinds of dramas in different ways have been given, and while the drama is always different, it is always the same. This does not mean that a Christ has appeared within each system of reality. It means that the idea of God has manifested within each system in a way that is comprehensible to the inhabitants. This drama continues to exist. It does not belong, for example, to your past. Only you have placed it there. This does not mean that it always reoccurs. The drama, then, was far from meaningless, and the spirit of Christ, in your terms, is legitimate. As I said, the crucifixion was a psychic event, and exists as do all the other events connected with the drama. Christ, the historical Christ, was not crucified. He had no intention of dying in that manner. But others felt that to fulfill the prophecies in all ways, crucifixion was a necessity. Christ did not take part in it. There was a conspiracy in which Judas played a role, an attempt to make a martyr out of Christ. The man chosen was drugged, hence the necessity of helping him carry the cross, and he was told that he was the Christ. He believed that he was. 
He was one of those deluded, but he also himself believed that he, not the historical Christ, was to fulfill the prophecies. Mary came because she was full of sorrow for the man who believed he was her son. Out of compassion, she was present. The group responsible wanted it to appear that one particular portion of the Jews had crucified Christ and never dreamed that the whole Jewish people would be blamed. The tomb was empty because the same group carted the body away. Mary Magdalene did see Christ, however, immediately after. Christ was a great psychic. He caused the wounds to appear then upon his own body and appeared both physically and in out-of-body states to his followers. He tried, however, to explain what had happened and his position, but those who were not in on the conspiracy would not understand and misread his statements. Peter three times denied the Lord, saying he did not know him, because he recognized that that person was not Christ. The plea, Peter, why hast thou forsaken me, came from the man who believed he was Christ, the drug version. Judas pointed out that man. He knew of the conspiracy and feared that the real Christ would be captured. Therefore he handed over to the authorities a man known to be a self-styled Messiah to save, not destroy, the life of the historical Christ. Symbolically, however, the crucifixion idea itself embodied deep dilemmas and meanings of the human psyche, and so the crucifixion per se became a far greater reality than the actual physical events that occurred at the time. Only the deluded are in danger of, or capable of, such self-sacrifice, you see, or find it necessary. Only those still bound up in ideas of crime and punishment would be attracted to that kind of religious drama and find within it deep echoes of their own subjective feelings. Christ knew clairvoyantly that these events in one way or another would occur and the probable dramas that could result. The man involved could not be swerved from his subjective decision. He would be sacrificed to make the old Jewish prophecies come true and he could not be dissuaded. In the Last Supper, when Christ said, this is my body and this is my blood. He meant to show that the spirit was within all matter, interconnected and yet apart. That his own spirit was independent of his body and also in his own way to hint that he should no longer be identified with his body. For he knew the dead body would not be his own. This was all misunderstood. Christ then changed his mode of behavior, appearing quite often in out-of-body states to his followers. Before, he had not done this to that degree. He tried to tell them, however, that he was not dead, and they chose to take him symbolically. His physical presence was no longer necessary, and was even an embarrassment under the circumstances. He simply willed himself out of it. He knew that without the wounds, they would not believe he was himself, because they were so convinced that he died with those wounds. They were to be a method of identification, to be dispensed with when he explained the true circumstances. He ate to prove he was still alive, but they took this simply to mean that the spirit could partake of food. They wanted to believe that he had been crucified and arisen. Other religions were based upon different traumas, in which ideas were acted out in a way that was comprehensible to various cultures. Unfortunately, the differences between the dramas often led to misunderstandings, and these were used as excuses for wars. These dramas are also privately worked out in the dream state. In visions and inspirations, men knew that the Christ drama would be enacted and hence recognized it for what it was when it occurred physically. Its power and strength then returned to the dream universe. It had increased its vigor and intensity through the physical materialization. In private dreams, men then related to the main figures in the drama, and in the dream state they recognized its true import. God is more than the sum of all the probable systems of reality he has created, and yet he is within each one of these, without exception. He is therefore within each man and woman. He is also within each spider, shadow, and frog, and this is what man does not like to admit. God can only be experienced, and you experience him, whether or not you realize it, through your own existence. He is not male or female, however, and I use the terms only for convenience's sake. In the most inescapable truth, he is not human in your terms at all, nor in your terms is he a personality. Your ideas of personality are too limited to contain the facets of his multidimensional existence. The inner experience with the multidimensional God can come in two main areas. 
One is through the realization that this prime moving force is within everything that you can perceive with your senses. The other method is to realize that this primary motive force has a reality independent of its connection with the world of appearances. As there are portions of reality that you do not consciously perceive, and other systems of probability of which you are not consciously aware, so also other aspects of primary godhood that you cannot at this moment comprehend. I have tried to give you some idea of the far-reaching creative effects of your own thoughts. With that in mind, then, it is impossible to imagine the multidimensional creativities that can be attributed to all that is. The term, all that is, can be used as a designation to include all of those probable gods in all of their manifestations. Now, it is easier, perhaps, for some of you to understand the simple stories and parables of beginnings of which I have spoken. But the time has come for mankind to take several steps further, to expand the nature of his own consciousness by trying to comprehend a more profound version of reality. You have outgrown the time of children's tales. When your own thoughts have a form and reality, when they have validity even in other systems of reality of which you are unaware, then it is not difficult to understand why other systems of probabilities are also affected by your own thoughts and emotions. Seth now speaks of reincarnation in terms of entire civilizations, such as those that preceded the existence of Atlantis. In a manner of speaking, it can be said that you have reincarnational civilizations as well as reincarnating individuals. Each entity who is born in flesh works toward the development of those abilities that can be best nurtured and fulfilled within the physical environment. He has a responsibility to and for the civilization in which he has each existence, for he helps form it through his own thoughts, emotions, and actions. He learns from failure as well as success. You think of physical history as beginning with the caveman and continuing up to the present, but there have been other great scientific civilizations, some spoken of in legend, some completely unknown, all in your terms now vanished. It seems to you that you have, perhaps, but one chance as a species to solve your problems or be destroyed by your own aggression, by your own lack of understanding and spirituality. But as you are given many lives in which to develop and fulfill your abilities, so has the species in those terms been allotted more than the single line of historical development with which you are presently acquainted. Groups of people in various cycles of reincarnational activity have met crisis after crisis, have come to your point of physical development and either gone beyond it or destroyed their particular civilization. In this case, they were given another chance, having the unconscious knowledge not only of their failure, but the reasons behind it. They then began with a psychological head start as they formed new primitive groupings. Others, solving the problems, left your physical planet for other points in the physical universe. When they reached that level of development, however, they were spiritually and psychically mature, and were able to utilize energies of which you now have no practical knowledge. Earth, to them, now is the legendary home. They formed new races and species that could no longer physically accommodate themselves to your atmospheric conditions. However, they also continued on the reincarnational level as long as they inhabited physical reality. Some of these have mutated and have long left the reincarnational cycle, however. Those who left it have evolved into the mental entities that they always were, you see. They have discarded material form. This group of entities still takes a great interest in Earth. They lend it support and energy. In a way, they could be thought of now as Earth gods. On your planet, they were involved in three particular civilizations long before the time of Atlantis, when, in fact, your planet itself was in a somewhat different position, particularly in relationship to three of the other planets that you know. The poles were reversed, as they were, incidentally, for three long periods of your planet's history. These civilizations were highly technological, the second one being, in fact, far superior to your own along those lines. Sound was utilized far more effectively, not only for healing and in wars, 
but also to power vehicles of locomotion and to bring about the movement of physical matter. Sound was a conveyor of weight and mass. The strength of this second civilization lay mainly in the areas now known as Africa and Australia, although at that time not only was the climate entirely different, but the land areas. There was a different attraction of land mass having to do with the altered position of the poles. Relatively speaking, however, the civilization was concentrated in area. It did not attempt to expand. It was highly ingrown and dwelled upon the planet simultaneously with a large, unorganized, dispersed, primitive culture. Not only did it make no attempt to civilize the rest of the world, but it did everything in its power, which was considerable for a long period of time, to impede any such progress. The members of this civilization were largely a fringe group from the earlier successful civilization, most of whom had decided to continue existence in other areas of your physical universe. These, however, were particularly enamored of earthly life and also thought that they could improve upon the last experiment in which they had been involved, though they were free to move on to other layers of existence. They were not interested in beginning from scratch again as an infant civilization, but in other areas. Therefore, much of their knowledge was instinctive with them, and this particular group then went through what you would call the various technological stages very rapidly. They were particularly concerned in the beginning with developing a human being who would have built-in safeguards against violence. With them, the desire for peace was almost what you would call an instinct. This civilization, therefore, left the natives that surrounded them in peace. They did send out members of their own group, however, to live with the natives and intermarry, hoping peacefully to thus alter the physiology of the species. The energy, often in your time given over to violence, went instead into other pursuits, but began to turn against them. They were not learning to deal with violence or aggression. They were attempting to short-circuit it physically, and this, they found, had complications. The physical alteration was a strain on the entire system, the urge to act, which is the creative function and basis that has been distorted into the idea of aggression, was not understood. An overly conscientious, restrictive mental and physical state evolved, in which the organism's natural physical need for survival was in every way hampered. Mentally, the civilization progressed. Its technology was extremely activated and propelled onward as it strove to develop, for example, artificial foods, so that it would not need to kill for survival in any way. At the same time, it tried to leave the environment intact. It missed your stage of automobiles completely and steam-driven vehicles and concentrated rather early on sound. The sound could not be heard by physical ears. The civilization was called Lumania, and the name itself went down in legend and was used again at a later time. The Lumanians were a very thin, weakly people, physically speaking, but psychically either brilliant or completely ungifted. In some, you see, the built-in controls caused so many blockages of energy in all directions that even their naturally high telepathic abilities suffered. They formed energy fields around their own civilization. They were, therefore, isolated from contact with other groups. They did not allow technology to destroy them, however. More and more of them realized that the experiment was not a success. Some, after physical death, left to join those from the previous successful civilization who had migrated to other planetary systems within the physical structure. Large groups, however, simply left their cities, destroyed the force fields that had enclosed them, and joined the many groups of relatively uncivilized people, mating with them and bearing children. These Lumanians died quickly, for they could not bear violence nor react to it violently. If attacked, they had to flee. The fight-or-flight principle did not apply. The Lumanians' god symbol was a male one, a strong, physically powerful male figure who would therefore protect them since they could not protect themselves. He evolved through the ages, as their beliefs did, and into him they projected those qualities that they could not themselves express. He was much later to appear as the old Jehovah, the god of wrath who protected the chosen people. The fear of natural forces was, therefore, initially extremely strong in them, and brought about a feeling of separation between man and those natural forces that nurtured him. They could not trust the earth, since they were not allowed to protect themselves against violent forces within it. 
Their vast technology and their great civilization was largely underground. They were, in those terms, the original cavemen, and they came out from their cities through caves also. Caves were not just places of protection in which unskilled natives squatted. They were often doorways to and from the cities of the Lumanians. Long after the cities were deserted, the following natives, uncivilized, found these caves and the openings. In the period that you now think of as the Stone Age, the men you think of as your ancestors, the cavemen, often found shelter not in rough, naturally formed caves, but in mechanically created channels that reached behind them and in the deserted cities in which once the Lumanians dwelled. Some of the tools fashioned by the cavemen were distorted versions of those they had found. I should perhaps mention here that some of the caves, particularly in certain areas of Spain and the Pyrenees, and some earlier ones in Africa, were artificial constructions. Now, these people moved mass with sound and actually conveyed matter through a high mastery of sound. This is how their tunnels were originally formed, and it was also the method used to form some of the caves in areas where originally there were few. Often, drawings on the cave walls were highly stylized information, almost like signs in your terms in front of public buildings, portraying the type of animals and beings in a given area. These drawings later were used as models by your early cavemen in the historical times to which you usually refer. The Lumanian civilization was the second and perhaps most interesting of the three civilizations. The first followed generally your own line of development and faced many of the problems that you now do. They were largely situated in what you call Asia Minor, but they were also expansive and traveled outward to other areas. These are the people I mentioned earlier who finally went on to other planets within other galaxies and from whom the people of the Lumanian civilization came. I have been speaking about the Lumanians in some detail because they are a part of your psychic heritage. The other two civilizations were in many ways more successful, and yet the strong intent behind the Lumanians' experiment was extremely volatile. While they were not able to solve the problem of violence, as they understood it in your reality, their passionate desire to do so still rings throughout your own psychic environment. Because of the true nature of time, the Lumanians still exist as they were in your terms. There are often bleed-throughs in the psychic atmosphere. These do not occur by chance, but when some kind of rapport causes effects to leap between systems that otherwise appear quite separated. And so, there have been such bleed-throughs between your own civilization and the Lumanians. Various old religions picked up the idea of the Lumanians' fierce god figure, for example, in whom they managed to project their concepts of force, power, and violence. This god who had meant to protect them when nonviolence would not allow them to protect themselves. There is a bleed-through now in the making, so to speak, in which the Lumanians' multidimensional concepts of art and communication will be glimpsed by our own people, but in a rudimentary form. As the various qualities of the Lumanians are still present in your psychic atmosphere, as their cities still coexist in land areas now called your own, so other probable identities coexist with the identities you now call your own. Now, Seth turns to the subject of the speakers. Christian dogma speaks of the ascension of Christ, implying, of course, a vertical ascent into the heavens, and the development of the soul is often discussed in terms of direction. To progress is supposedly to ascend, while the horror of religious punishment, hell, is seen at the bottom of all things. Development is therefore considered in a one-line direction only, in Christian terms. But development unfolds in all directions. The soul is not ascending a series of stairs, each one representing a new and higher point of development. Instead, the soul stands at the center of itself, exploring, extending its capacities in all directions at once, involved in issues of creativity, each one highly legitimate. For this reason, the nature of good and evil is a highly important point. We go back to our fundamentals. You create reality through your feelings, thoughts, and mental actions. You must understand that each mental act is a reality for which you are responsible. That is what you are in this particular system of reality for. As long as you believe in a devil, for example, you will create one that is real enough for you and for the others who continue to create him. Because of the energy he is given by others, he will have a certain consciousness of his own. 
But such a mock devil has no power or reality to those who do not believe in his existence and who do not give him energy through their belief. He is, in other words, a superlative hallucination. Some very old religions understood the hallucinatory nature of the devil concept. But even in Egyptian times, the simpler and more distorted ideas became prevalent, particularly with the masses of people. In some ways, men in those times could not understand the concept of a god without the concept of a devil. There are no devils waiting to carry anyone off unless you create them yourself, in which case the power resides in you and not in the mock devils. The crucifixion of Christ and the attendant drama made sense within your reality at the time. It arose into the world of physical actuality out of the inner reality from which your deepest intuitions and insights also spring. The methods, the secret methods behind all of the religions were meant to lead man into a realm of understanding that existed apart from the symbols and the stories, lead him into inner realizations that would take him both within and without the physical world that he knew. There are many manuscripts still not discovered from old monasteries, particularly in Spain, that tell of underground groups within religious orders who kept these secrets alive when other monks were copying old Latin manuscripts. There were tribes who never learned to write in Africa and Australia who also knew these secrets, and men called speakers who memorized them and spread them upward even throughout northern portions of Europe before the time of Christ. There have been less than 30 great speakers. The Christ entity was one. The Buddha was another. These speakers are as active when they are non-physical as when they are physical. The Christ entity had many reincarnations before the emergence of the Christ personality as known, as did the Buddha. The original source of the speaker data is the inner knowledge of the nature of reality that is within each individual. The speakers are to keep the information alive in physical terms, to see that men do not bury it within and dam it up, to bring the information to the attention of the conscious self. The Druids obtained some of their concepts from speakers. So did the Egyptians. The speakers predated the emergence of any religions that you know, and the religions of the speakers arose spontaneously in many scattered areas, then grew like wildfire from the heart of Africa and Australia. There was one separate group in an area where the Aztecs dwelled at a later date, though the land mass was somewhat different then, and some of the lower cave dwellings at times were underwater. Various bands of the speakers continued through the centuries. Because they were trained so well, the messages retained their authenticity. They believed, however, that it was wrong to set words into written form, and so did not record them. The speakers, singly, existed in your Stone Age period and were leaders. Their abilities helped the cavemen survive. There was little physical communication, however, in those days between the various speakers, and some were unaware of the existence of the others. Their message was as pure and undistorted as possible. It was for this reason, however, through the centuries, that many who heard it translated it into parables and tales. Now, strong portions of Jewish scriptures carry traces of the message of these early speakers, but even here, distortions have hidden the messages. Since consciousness forms matter, and not the other way around, then thought exists before the brain and after it. A child can think coherently before he learns vocabulary, but he cannot impress the physical universe in its terms. So this inner knowledge has always been available, but has to become physically manifest, literally made flesh. The speakers were the first to impress this inner knowledge upon the physical system, to make it physically known. Sometimes only one or two speakers were alive in several centuries. Sometimes there were many. They looked around them and knew that the world sprang from their interior reality. They told others. They knew that the seemingly solid natural objects about them were composed of many minute consciousnesses. They realized that from their own creativity they formed idea into matter, and that the stuff of matter was itself conscious and alive. They were intimately familiar with the natural rapport existing between themselves and their environment, and knew that they could alter their environment through their own acts. The speakers possess an extraordinary vividness of feeling and thought projection. They can impress others with greater import through their communications. 
They can move from inner to outer reality with easy ability. They know instinctively how to use symbolism. They are highly creative on an unconscious level, constantly forming psychic frameworks beneath normal consciousness that can be used both by themselves and others in dream and trance states. They often appear to others in the dream condition, and they help dreamers in the manipulation of inner reality. They form images with which the dreamers can relate, images that can be used as bridges and then as gateways into kinds of consciousness more separated from your own. The symbolism of the gods, the idea of the gods on Olympus, for example, the crossing over point at the river Styx, that kind of phenomena was originated by the speakers. The speakers were not confined in their activities to waking consciousness. In all periods of your time, they went about their duties both in the waking and sleep state. Conventional images of the Christian God and the saints may be utilized by the speakers with all of this highly vivid. The dreamer may find himself then in a magnificent harem or instead in a brilliantly illuminated field or sky. Some speakers confine their abilities to the dream state and waking are largely unconscious of their own abilities or experience. Now it is meaningless to call such dreams or dream places hallucinations for they are representations of definitive objective realities that you cannot perceive as yet in their own guise. The Egyptian religion was largely based upon the work of the speakers and great care was given to their training. The outward manifestations given to the masses of the people became so distorted, however, that the original unity of the religion finally decayed. Each individual in his dreams has access to the information possessed by the speakers. There are adjacent states of consciousness that occur within the sleep pattern that cannot be picked up by your EEGs, that is, your scientific tracings of brain waves, adjacent corridors through which your consciousness travels. Now, this happens in every night's sleep. Two areas of activity are involved, one very passive and one acutely active. In one state, this portion of consciousness is passive, receiving information. In the next stage, it is active as it takes part through action. The concepts given it are then vividly perceived through participation and examples. This is the most protected area of sleep. The rejuvenating characteristics enter in here, and it is during this period that the speakers act as teachers and guides. Through the ages, the speakers have taught dreamers how to manipulate in these other environments. They have taught them how to bring back information that could be used for the good of the present personality. According to the intent, present purpose, and development, an individual may be aware of these travels to varying degrees. Some have excellent recall, for example, but often misinterpret their experience because of conscious ideas. It is very possible for one dreamer who is a speaker to go to the aid of another individual who is having some difficulties in an inner reality within the dream state. The idea of guardian angels, of course, is highly connected here. A good speaker is as effective within one reality as he is within the other, creating psychic frameworks within physical reality as well as within interior environments. Many artists, poets, and musicians are speakers, translating one world in terms of another, forming psychic structures that exist in both with great vitality, structures that may be perceived from more than one reality at a time. Most dreams are like animated postcards brought back from a journey that you have returned from and largely forgotten. The speakers help you in the formation of dreams which are indeed multidimensional artistic productions of a kind. Dreams existing in more than one reality with effects that dissect various stages of consciousness that are real in your terms to both the living and the dead and in which both the living and the dead may participate. It is for this reason that inspirations and revelations are so often a part of the dream condition. Consciousness at different levels or stages perceives different kinds of events. In order to perceive some of these, you have only to learn to change the focus of your attention from one level to another. These stages of consciousness are all a part of your own reality. A knowledge of them can be most useful. You can learn to shift gears, stand aside from your own experience, and examine it with much better perspective. You can prepare questions or problems suggesting that they be solved for you in the sleep state. You can suggest that you will speak with distant friends or convey important messages that you cannot convey verbally, perhaps. You can bring about reconciliations, for example, 
at another layer of reality, though you cannot do so in this one. You can direct the healing of your body, telling yourself that this will be accomplished by you at one of the other levels of sleep consciousness. You may ask for the aid of a speaker to give you any necessary psychological guidance that is needed to maintain health. If you have particular conscious goals, and if you are reasonably certain that they are beneficial ones, then you can suggest dreams in which they occur, for the dreams themselves will hasten their physical reality. Now, unconsciously, you do many of these things. You often go back in time, so to speak, and relive a particular event so that it has a different ending, or say things that you wish you had said. A knowledge of one state of consciousness can help you in other states. In a light trance, the meaning of dream symbols will be given if you ask for them. The symbols may then be used as methods of suggestion that will be tailored for you personally. If you discover, say, that a fountain in a dream represents refreshment, then when you are tired or depressed, think of a fountain. The production of dreams is as sophisticated an endeavor as is the production of the objective life of a given individual. It is simply living on different terms. And now, Seth discusses the meaning of religion and the second coming. The outer world is a reflection of the inner one, though far from perfect. The inner knowledge can be compared to a book about a homeland that a traveler takes with him into a strange country. Each man is born with the yearning to make these truths real for himself, though he sees a great difference between them and the environment in which he lives. An internal drama is carried on by each individual, a psychic drama which is finally projected outward with great force upon the field of history. The birth of great religious events emerges from the interior religious drama. The drama itself is a psychological phenomenon in a way, for each physically oriented self feels thrust alone into a strange environment without knowing its origins or destination or even the reason for its own existence. Thus, you deal often with events in which men are touched by great illumination, isolated from the masses of humanity and endowed with great powers. Periods of history that appear almost unnaturally brilliant in contrast with others. Prophets, geniuses, and kings shown in greater than human proportion. These people are chosen by others to manifest outwardly the interior truths that all intuitively know. There are many levels of significance here. On the one hand, such individuals receive their unearthly abilities and power from their fellows, contain it, exhibit it in the physical world for all to see. They play the part of the blessed inner self that actually cannot operate within physical reality uncloaked by flesh. This energy, however, is a quite valid projection from the interior self. The personality so touched by it actually does then become, in certain terms, what he seems to be. He will emerge as an eternal hero in the external religious drama, as the inner self is the eternal hero of the interior religious drama. When such a personality appears in history, then, he is intuitively recognized, for the way has long been laid, and in many cases the prophecies announcing such an arrival have already been given. The individuals so chosen do not just happen to appear among you. They are not chosen at random. They are individuals who have taken upon themselves the responsibility for this role. After their birth, they are aware to varying degrees of their destiny, and certain trigger experiences may at times arouse their full memory. They serve quite clearly as human representatives of all that is. Now, since each individual is a part of all that is, to some extent each of you serve in that same role. In such a religious drama, however, the main personality is much more conscious of his inner knowledge. He is more aware of his abilities, far better able to use them, and exultantly familiar with his relations to all of life. Ideas of good and evil, gods and devils, salvation and damnation, are merely symbols of deeper religious values, cosmic values, if you will, that cannot be translated into physical terms. These ideas become the driving themes of these religious dramas of which I have spoken. The actors may return, time and time again, in different roles. In any given historic religious drama, the actors may have already appeared on the historic scene in your past, the prophet of today being the traitor of the past drama. Behind the actors in the dramas, 
there are more powerful entities who are quite beyond role-playing. The plays themselves, then, the religions that sweep across the ages, these are merely shadows, though helpful ones. Behind the frame of good and evil is a far deeper spiritual value. All religions, therefore, while trying to catch truth, must to some large degree fear its ever eluding them. The main character in a religious historical drama may or may not consciously be aware of the ways in which such information is given to him. And yet it may seem to him that he does know, for the nature of a dogma's origin will be explained in terms that this main character can understand. The historical Jesus knew who he was, but he also knew that he was one of three personalities composing one entity. To a large extent, he shared in the memory of the other two. The third personality has not in your terms yet appeared, although his existence has been prophesied as the second coming. Now, these prophecies were given in terms of the current culture at that time, and therefore, while the stage has been set, the distortions are deplorable. This Christ will not come at the end of your world, as the prophecies have been maintaining. He will not come to reward the righteous and send evildoers to eternal doom. He will, however, begin a new religious drama. A certain historical continuity will be maintained. As happened once before, however, he will not be generally known for who he is. There will be no glorious proclamation to which the whole world will bow. He will return to straighten out Christianity, which will be in a shambles at the time of his arrival, and to set up a new system of thought when the world is sorely in need of one. By that time, all religions will be in severe crisis, he will undermine religious organizations, not unite them. His message will be that of the individual in relation to all that is. He will clearly state methods by which each individual can attain a state of intimate contact with his own entity, the entity to some extent being man's mediator with all that is. By 2075, all of this will be already accomplished. You may make a note here that Nostradamus saw the dissolution of the Roman Catholic Church as the end of the world. He could not imagine civilization without it. Hence, many of his later predictions should be read with this in mind. In your terms, and in your terms only, the coming of Christ was the second coming. In those terms, and again this is important, in those terms only, he appeared at the time of Atlantis, but the records were destroyed and forgotten. Now, again in those terms, he is an entity who appears time and time again within your physical system, but he has been recognized on only two occasions, once in Atlantis and once in the Christ story as it has come down to you in all of its distortions. He appears and reappears, therefore, sometimes making himself known and sometimes not. He was not one personality, as I have told you, but a highly developed entity, sometimes appearing as a fragment of himself. In your terms, he eternally weaves himself within the fabric of your time and space, born again and again into the world of flesh, being a part of it while also independent of it, even as you are all a part of it but independent of it. The third historical personage, already born in your terms, and a portion of the entire Christ personality, had superior energy and power and great organizing abilities but it was the errors that he made unwittingly that perpetuated some dangerous distortions. The records of that historical period are scattered and contradictory. The man, historically now, was Paul or Saul. It was given to him to set up a framework, but it was to be a framework of ideas, not of regulations, of men, not of groups. Here he fell down, and he will return as the third personality in your future. Paul tried to deny knowing who he was until his experience with conversion. Allegorically.